The Evo 16 and SP8 have been out for a while now and I think it's finally time we have a look at them. Hey, Julian Krauss here and with me I got the Audi and Evo 16 and SP8 extension. In this video we're going to have a look at both of them, check out their features and performance and talk a bit about the pros and cons. Full disclaimer, audience sent me the Evo 16 and SP8 in return for an honest review. That's also why I'm labeling this video as an advertisement, but all measurements and opinions in this video are my own and Audient has no say in the making of this video. Before we start, what's the difference between the Evo 16 and SP8 anyways? The Evo 16 is essentially the bigger brother of the SP8 and can do everything that the SP8 can do with additional USB connectivity and two headphone outputs. On its own, the SP8 cannot be used to record audio to a PC and it's used as an extension for ADAT interfaces or as a standalone mic preamp. The SP8 is designed to be used in conjunction with the Evo 16 and then it has some additional features, which I will show you later when we have a look at the software. But of course you can also use the SP8 to extend the number of channels with any other ADAT interface, for example Audience own ID44 Mark II, but also other brands like Focusrite Claret Series or a Moto Ultralight will work. Alright, let's jump right in and while you subscribe I will give you a quick overview of the hardware. As you can see the SP8 and EVO 16 are very similar looking and from the outside there are actually only a few small differences. The first difference is a few missing knobs and headphone outputs on the SP8. The EVO 16 offers two quarter inch headphone connections and it allows you to control the volume of the main output and the two headphone connections individually. With the additional function button you can censor vulgar vocalists. Okay, jokes aside, the function button allows you to do things like dim your speakers, switch between your main monitors and alternative speakers, talkback or switching the outputs to mono. The other things on the front are identical though for the EVO 16 and SP8. You get a small monitor which displays audio levels, shows volume settings and allows you to navigate the menu. I gotta say the encoder to do the navigation is really quite responsive and the menu is very easy to use. Only complaint here with the display is that it is quite small and especially the minus signs in front of the numbers are sometimes easy to miss. Also the off-axis viewing performance is quite weak and if you have a look at the display at a steeper angle it can be very difficult to read. Also to see if the phantom power is turned on you have to select the channel first and I think it would have been great if there was an indicator for each input on the input screen. That said, I found myself hardly using the display anyways, as you can control pretty much every functionality of the EVO 16 and SP8 via the software, which as mentioned before we will have a look at later. One thing Audient is highlighting about the EVO 16 and SP8 is the Smart Gain feature. When you click the button you get to select the channel that the interface should set the gain for, and then you record a 10 second segment. The gain is then automatically set to an ideal level determined by the interface. When the SP8 is connected, this even goes simultaneously for all 16 inputs. I tested this feature with multiple mics connected and it did work quite well, setting the gain so that the audio level was peaking around minus 18 dBFS, which is actually where I would have set the gain manually myself. Only with very low sound sources and low output mics, the smart gain feature was sometimes struggling a bit to set the gain correctly. With fewer channels, I have to confess the smart gain feature is less useful because you can often set the gain quicker manually when you know what you're doing. But especially for higher channel counts, the smart gain feature can be quite handy to get many channels into the right ballpark very quickly and I think this is where this feature excels. The two frontal inputs on the SP8 and EVO 16 can be toggled between line and instrument inputs and as mentioned you can toggle phantom power on a per channel basis with the 48V button. The gain of the channels is controlled by selecting the channel and then turning the encoder knob. Easy as that. And lastly, as mentioned, the SP8 and EVO 16 have two mic, line and instrument inputs on the front. The backside is quite similar again and you can find six mic or line inputs each. Additionally, you get eight balanced line outputs and to enable ADAT connectivity, there are two optical in and two optical toslink outputs. To sync more devices, there's also a BNC word clock connection and while both interfaces have a USB-C connection, only the EVO 16 can send audio to a PC via this connection. The USB connection on the SP8 is used for firmware updates only. And lastly you get a power connection directly on the interface which needs to be connected for the interface to operate. The similarities of the SP8 and EVO 16 are also quite evident when we have a look inside. The input section is actually 100% identical and the only bigger difference is the missing headphone output board and the SP8 has one less DAC chip 
as it does not need to drive the headphone outputs. Speaking of which, the analog to digital conversion is done by an ESS ES9840 and the digitally controlled preamps are that 6266. And the DAC that is doing its conversion magic is the ESS ES9017, which again you can find one on the SP8 and two of them on the EVO 16. A few more detailed pictures of the internals can be found on my Patreon if you're interested and you also want to support the channel. If you ask yourself why there is quite a bit of space in here, I assume this is to get a relatively standardized form factor because the EVO 16 and the ASP8 can also be mounted in a rack with separately purchasable rack ears. One thing to keep in mind, if you are going for the EVO 16 and SP8 combination, you will need to purchase at least four short Toslink cables to get the full functionality out of this stack. And with more SP8s connected, you will also need BNC cables and splitters to keep the clocks in sync. Just so you know. As of the time of making this review, the EVO 16 seems to power down about 30 minutes when not in use, but can be easily woken up again with a simple push of a button. The SP8 on the other hand seems to stay on indefinitely until you turn it off manually. I've spoken to Audient about that and they are currently looking into adding further options for the power settings and I also suggested that the SP8 should be turned off automatically when the EVO 16 goes to sleep as well. That's also something that they're currently investigating and I hope they can pull that off because that makes using the EVO 16 and SP8 combination even more convenient. Okay, let's check out the audio quality with some measurements and I want to point out that I'm going to mainly show the measurements from the EVO 16 here, but if I don't say anything else, they are exactly the same for the SP8. With so many mic inputs, let's have a look at them first. The frequency response should be flat for an uncolored sound and that's exactly what we can see, even at the maximum gain setting, which is a worst case scenario. There's only about a 1 dB roll off at 20 Hz, but in practice this is inaudible, so that's a really good performance. And you might have also noticed that the response rolls off sharply around 48 kHz, and that's due to the maximum sample rate of 96 kHz of the EVO 16 and SP8. But unless you want to record bats, that's also totally fine. Okay, let's have a look at distortion and here I notice something interesting. The performance is actually really good until the audio clips just before 0 dBFS. I noticed that this behavior depends on the specific gain setting that you use. In some settings the signal can go all the way up to 0 dBFS and only then distorts, which is how it should be, but at other settings the signal already distorts slightly before 0 dBFS. This means that in practice you should stay away from 0 dBFS slightly more than with other interfaces, just to be sure that your signal never clips. Not sure if this can be fixed with a firmware update, but if you leave yourself some headroom while recording, this usually shouldn't be an issue. On the note of headroom, for that you want to have a nice amount of dynamic range, which is the ratio of the strongest signal the interface can capture and its noise floor. This should be as high as possible and in my measurements the EVO 16 and SP8 come in at around 112 dBA, which is not record breaking but a real solid performance and there are not many people that need more than that. But I have to mention something because the dynamic range actually changes slightly with the different gain levels. As you can see here in the lower and middle gain range, the dynamic range makes some jumps, so depending on where you set your gain at, you might get a slightly worse technical performance. Now does that make any noticeable difference in practice? Probably not, and I would say just set your gain to where you get a good recording level and don't worry about this topic too much, but I thought it was quite interesting nonetheless. Now to one of the more important things about a microphone input, especially when you use dynamic microphones. Preamp noise. This should be as low as possible to get low noise recordings with low sensitive dynamic microphones, which need a lot of amplification. And that's exactly what I want to demonstrate here. I have a Shure SM7B connected directly to the EVO 16, which is pretty much a worst case scenario. So let me be quiet for you to listen to the noise floor. That's quite low noise and my measurements confirm that. Both the EVO 16 and the SP8 came in at around minus 127 dBUA weighted and that's a good performance. As you can see the EVO 16 and SP8 are bested by quite a few other interfaces but I think this is the price you pay for digitally controlled preamps.
The performance is still very good, but if you want to eke out the last two decibels of preamp noise performance, you can of course use something like a cloud fed lift ahead. But in most cases, this is really not needed. One thing I noticed though is that the gain the Evo 16 that the SP8 can provide is lower than on other interfaces. This isn't necessarily an issue as you can easily amplify the signal digitally in post-production, but in a live streaming setup where you don't have this option, some microphones, especially like the SM7B, might be a bit quiet. Let me quickly glance over the line level input performance as it is very similar to the mic inputs. The frequency response is nearly a flat line in the audible range, no complaints here. Dynamic range on the EVO 16 and SP8 are once again the same and also nearly identical to the mic inputs with 112.2 dBA. Not record breaking, but a real solid amount of dynamic range and good for the majority of recording situations. One thing I notice is that in terms of distortion, the rear inputs are slightly better than the frontal ones. Not that you would ever hear this difference, especially not if you leave yourself some headroom, but purely from a technical side, the rear inputs are slightly better. And just to mention it here, the line inputs also accept a proper professional line level signal up to 18 dBV, which is great to see. And that rhymes. Jumping over to the main output performance and here we also have not too much to talk about and I mean that in a good way because noise and distortions are really at an audible level. The frequency response is virtually a flat line across the chart and the dynamic range is over 120 dBA which is excellent and distortions sit around to minus 120 decibels below the test signal which is most certainly inaudible. Audience states in their specs that the output performance of the SP8 is ever so slightly worse than the EVO 16, but in my tests the SP8 has only 2 dB less dynamic range and a tiny bit more distortion, which is still not audible and in my opinion both devices are completely transparent. This means that you will only hear the playback audio without any audible noise or distortion. Excellent performance. Headphone output time and this is of course only relevant for the EVO 16 as the SP8 doesn't have any headphone outputs. In this table you can directly compare the performance of the EVO 16 with other interfaces and I just want to highlight the more important things here. The frequency response is ruler flat with a dummy load, although let's see what happens when you connect a real pair of headphones. Well, here you can see the measurement with three different headphones connected. All of them are 32 ohm headphones, but as you can see their performance is impacted differently by the EVO 16. With the worst contender here, you have a deviation of up to 3 decibels, which is plainly audible. You might have already guessed it, this is the result of the relatively high output impedance of 22 ohm. I've made a full video explaining the issue with the high output impedance, but in short you can see that depending on the used pair of headphones, the frequency response might change and this adds uncertainty which is of course not something that you want for precise music monitoring. The issue is mitigated by using higher impedance headphones like 80 ohms and above with the EVO 16 but I just don't understand why one is forced into using high impedance headphones for accurate sound reproduction. The 22 ohm output impedance in my opinion is simply too high. Power output is good and I would argue that most headphones can be driven to loud listening levels although slightly more power wouldn't have hurt, especially for a wall-powered interface. In terms of distortion, I really cannot complain. These are vanishingly low amounts of distortion, regardless of the used headphone impedance. Noise levels are also quite good. With over-ear headphones, there should be no chance that you will hear noise from the outputs. And one of the benefits of digitally controlled volume is that the left and right channels are always equally loud, regardless of the volume setting. Nice. So if it hadn't been for the high output impedance, this would have been an excellent headphone output performance through and through. Alright, quick dive into the software. At first glance you get a good overview of all the in and output levels. For each channel you have additional features. You have for example pan controls, solo and mute features and you can stereo link channels which also synchronizes their input gain. In the software you can also turn on phantom power for each channel individually and remotely set the gain for each channel which I think is really quite handy to have as you don't have to reach for the interface to control everything. The nice thing about the EVO 16 and SP8 combination is that you can remotely control the gain and phantom power controls of the SP8 in the software and when using the EVO 16 and SP8 combination it is a seamless integration and it works just like a bigger audio interface. Pretty cool. 
One point of critique here is the missing gain number in the software. For example, if you like to set multiple channels to the same amount of gain, you can currently just eyeball it in the software or dial it in precisely on the interface. I really hope that they can also add the gain number in the software. Two minor things that could be improved are that the level meters are missing a DBFS scale. There is a scale right next to the level meter, which shows some values, but these are also not aligned to the meter, which I found a bit confusing. And the font is really quite tiny on 4K screens, and I think the UI could benefit from a font size setting. On a more positive note, the software does offer five independent mixes, a master and QA to D mix. Via the settings, you get access to the routing options, which lets you send the different mixes to different outputs. On that note, the mixing is of course done digitally, which brings some amount of latency. But I measured it and the direct monitoring latency was never higher than 0.3 milliseconds, which is not perceptible. All good here. Back to the settings and here just one word of caution. By default, the digital in and outputs were set to SPDIF and I was wondering for quite some time why the SP8 wasn't fully working with the EVO 16 until I stumbled across this setting. You have a few more features here like setting the clock source, setting the level for AB monitoring and a talkback feature which can use any audio source on your PC, even a connected USB microphone. You also get a button to use talkback in the software and a few more monitoring controls. At the very top, you also get the option to save and recall mixes, which can be quite handy. Although you have to be a bit careful because when you're going to load a mix and accidentally click the X, then the preset is completely gone. There should definitely be another pop-up here to confirm the deletion and I hope Audient can improve that. You have a few more controls for what you want to see in the software and a drop-down to select things like the sample rate and buffer size. There you can also select a loopback source and also store your settings directly to the EVO 16. Of course, I've also tested the round trip latency, which is important when you want to monitor your audio in real time with effects from your DAW. Here you can see the times with different buffer sizes and 48 kHz. And here with 96 kHz. All in all, I would say these are pretty average times. Let's close this out and start with the things to consider before buying an EVO 16 and SP8. Neither the EVO 16 nor the SP8 have any integrated audio processing, which might be important for some of you. There are also no MIDI connections on both devices, so that's something to consider as well. Sadly, as mentioned, the output impedance of the two headphone outputs on the EVO 16 is relatively high and that kind of forces you to use headphones with at least 80 ohms if accurate sound reproduction is important for you. On the plus side, you get a lot of microphone inputs, which is especially handy when recording full band and drums. And one of the bigger features is that you are able to control all settings remotely with the software without the need to reach for the interface. With the ADAT connections, you can expand the in and outputs to a total of 24 channels, and the SPA is the perfect way to do that, as it seamlessly integrates with the EVO 16. All options are controllable via the software, as if the SP8 and the EVO 16 combination is just one big interface. To make life easy with that many channels, there's also a smart gain feature with which you can get multiple channels to a decent recording level in just a few seconds. Overall, I think with the EVO 16 and SP8 you get quite a lot for the money on their own, and in combination they are a compelling option when many in and outputs are needed. Please give this video a thumbs up. Subscribe if you didn't already do so and I will see you all in the next one.